Our scripture reading today comes from Psalm 27. Hear now the word of God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, Seek my face. My heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek? Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week, I began a two-sermon series on suffering. I preached on the mystery of suffering and said that God does not give us answers. Well, he does not give us reasons for our suffering. Instead, he asks us to trust him. God does not give us explanations, but he does give us an answer. It's not the kind of answer a professor could put on a blackboard or a pastor could put on a PowerPoint slide, but it is substantial. And I promise to share it with you today, and so I will, at least as far as I am able. The answer that God gives to suffering has two parts. I call one of them the ultimate answer, and the other the practical answer. The ultimate answer is powerful. It is given to us by God, but it requires faith, at least for now. The practical answer is derived from the ultimate answer, and it is offered to us in our scripture reading today. The ultimate answer will clear up all doubt and confusion. The practical answer helps us to endure suffering here and now. I apologize if all this sounds a little confusing. I trust that it will become clear as we go along. I think that the best way to go forward is to explain first the ultimate answer that God has given to suffering, and then turn to Psalm 27 to find the practical answer. So let's get started. God's ultimate answer to suffering is new creation. New creation is a significant theme in Scripture. The Old Testament prophets foretold a day when the wolf shall lie down with the lamb, when the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. The prophets spoke of all the nations turning to the one true God who would rule them in peace. Then the New Testament ratchets up this hope even further. Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God both as a present reality and also as something far more wonderful that is still in the future. 
Paul wrote in Romans 8. The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And of course, the revelation ends the Bible with a vision of a new heaven and a new earth. It says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. In other words, God has promised, You ain't seen nothing yet. So God has promised for his children a future of unimaginable bliss. No death, no evil, no suffering. We will see God face to face as he is and rejoice and delight in his glory. We will dwell together in perfect peace, justice, and righteousness. Of course, the Bible says this is the destiny of those who belong to Jesus Christ. It is not automatic or universal, so we must put our faith in Christ. For only if God transforms us and makes us like Jesus can we hope to endure the brilliance, the radiance of God's glory. But God will transform us. For those who are in Christ will be resurrected as he was and share in his glory. He will make us perfectly holy. He will give us the power to love perfectly both God and one another. This is a God-sized vision that fulfills the deepest longings of the human heart. This biblical promise of new creation raises a couple of questions. One is, will it really happen? Or is it just wishful thinking like so many utopian fantasies? And the second one is, assuming it does happen, will this new creation make all of the suffering that preceded it worth it? I'm not going to spend much time on the first question. If you believe God raised Jesus from the dead, you should believe in new creation. Because Jesus' resurrection was the beginning of new creation. Scripture calls him the first fruits. So if you believe that Jesus is alive, then you should believe God's promise. If you don't know the Savior, then the place you should start your quest for answers is with Jesus. Who did he claim to be? What did he teach? Did he do what he said he would do? And did God raise him from the dead? Question two is the one that concerns us today. Because if the answer is yes, then God gives an answer to our suffering. Someday, God makes all things new, new heaven, new earth, new us. And in that moment, when we behold God's glory, not through a glass darkly, but face to face, in that moment, we will look back on our life on earth. We will look back on the history of the earth with all the war and disasters and oppression. And what will we say? Will we look back and say, well, I'm glad all that's over because this world is so much better. I hope not. I hope that's not what we will say. I hope that is not the best we can say because if that is the best we can say, then God will have given no answer to suffering. God will have failed to demonstrate his goodness. Instead, 
I think that in that moment we will look back and suddenly our eyes will get wide with wonder and a little cartoon light bulb will appear above our heads. Not really, but you get the idea. And suddenly we will see and it'll make sense and we will say, yes, of course, I get it now. I always wondered why the world was the way it was with all the pain and all the suffering. But now I see how it fits together. God had a plan all along. God was working with a purpose and his purpose was good and it was loving. And now it makes sense. In that moment, we will see the goodness of God. Now I admit that this idea might seem crazy for the simple reason that we can't imagine it now. From the present moment, given our limited experience and the tiny processing power of our brain, we can't imagine how God could ever do that. How could God create a world that is not just better than this one? We can imagine that easily enough. But how can he create a world that makes all the suffering of this world worth it? We don't know. I submit to you that only God can answer that question. And he will answer it by creating that world. And we will see it if we are in Christ. Not only will we see it, but we will be a part of it. And then we will know. Now, as I say, this ultimate answer demands faith, at least for now, at least until our faith becomes sight. On Wednesdays, I've been teaching a class on C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. C.S. Lewis is a beloved Christian author because he not only had a brilliant mind, he had a creative imagination. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He wrote The Great Divorce, which is a book about people in hell taking field trips to heaven. He wrote the Screw Tape Letters and even a space trilogy. Even C.S. Lewis, with his brilliant and creative mind, could not envision how God could create a world that would make the suffering in this world worth it. But he believed that God could. In his book, The Great Divorce, he has one of his characters say, This is what mortals misunderstand. They say of some temporal suffering, no future bliss could make up for it not knowing that heaven, once attained, will work backwards and turn even that agony into glory. Isn't that an intriguing way of putting it? That heaven will work backwards, turning our agony into glory. Dane Ortland is a Presbyterian minister and an author who's written a book called Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. This is yet another book that I highly recommend. The main idea of this book is that we often think that Jesus must struggle to love us, sinful and broken as we are. But in reality, Jesus loves us far more deeply and strongly than we dare imagine, for that is his heart. Toward the end of this book, Ortland quotes that line from C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce that I just read to you, and he adds this. Those who are in Christ are promised that all the haunted brokenness that infects everything Every relationship, every conversation, every family, every email, every waking to consciousness in the morning, every job, every vacation, everything. 
all the haunted brokenness that infects everything will one day be rewound and reversed. The more darkness and pain we experience in this life, the more resplendence and relief in the next. What does that mean? Can it be that our brokenness, our suffering, will be transformed as the scars of the risen Christ were transformed, the nail marks in his hand, the spear mark in his side, that our suffering and brokenness will be transformed into testimonies of God's glory, that these testimonies will make us beautiful and cause us to praise God. I dare to believe that that is true. You may think I'm naive. You may think I'm willfully stupid. But let me tell you why I believe. I start with the idea that God is infinitely wiser and cleverer than I am. Just because I can't imagine how God could do it doesn't mean God can't do it. And then I look at what God has already done how he used the cross of Christ to save us. The crucifixion of the innocent and holy Son of God was the worst evil humanity ever perpetrated or ever will. And given our track record for evil, that's saying a lot. But you see what God did. God took our worst evil and he used it as the means to save us from sin and death. He took our worst evil and used it to demonstrate his love and glory. Now that is judo on a cosmic scale. In judo, you try to use your opponent's weight and momentum against them. And that's what God did. He took our worst and gave us his best. And if he can do that, well, what can't he do? In the cross and resurrection of Jesus, God demonstrated both the love and the power necessary for new creation. Or to put it a bit more crudely, because I know the living Savior, I would never bet against God to create a world that makes all the suffering of this world worth it. Now, if you don't know the Savior, I can understand how you would find this idea unbelievable. But if you know him, you should trust his promises. Okay. So that's God's ultimate answer to our suffering. New creation. Someday God will make all things new, new heaven, new earth, new us. We see God face to face. We live together in perfect love and joy. But that's someday. What about today? God's answer to suffering is still in the future, but we suffer today. So what is the practical answer to suffering? It's offered to us beautifully in Psalm 27. Psalm 27 is a shifty little psalm, so much so that some scholars have thought it was originally two psalms that got spliced together because the first half expresses confident trust in God while the second half basically begs God to help. But this is one psalm, and it always has been. And if you have faith and you've ever suffered, then you recognize this dynamic. What we see in Psalm 27 is a person of faith who is stretched. We see faith being compressed. We see 
what it looks like when a person of faith goes through the ringer. The last week I preached, don't be afraid because you have a big God. Well, David agreed with that. Psalm 27 is attributed to King David. Look at verse 1. David said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now that's a confident trust in God. That's the kind of faith that struts. And look at verse 3. It says, Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. David started out with a lot of faith, a strong faith, when he was just a boy. And years of obeying God had strengthened his faith even more. I think David was far ahead of where I am, and I would suspect where you are as well. If an army camped against you, would you be afraid? I would. I'm afraid of inflation. But although I'm not as far along as David was, I know exactly how he felt. And I hope that you do too. I hope that you know that God is your light and your salvation so that you're not afraid. But although David knows God, David also knows suffering. Verse 2 mentions evildoers. Verse 3 talks about war. Verse 12 brings in false witnesses. That immediately makes us think of Jesus at his trials. Many false witnesses gave testimony against him. Verse 10 is interesting because it is so intense. David writes, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. So far as we know, in the case of David, that was hyperbole. His father and mother never actually abandoned him. The Bible says nothing about David's mother. We know that David had a lot of support from his tribe, the tribe of Judah. So why would his father abandon him? This is probably just a figurative way of speaking. David is saying the last people in the world who would ever abandon me would be my father and mother. But even if they did, so that I was completely alone in the world, the Lord would take me in. Of course, for some few people, this is a literal truth. They have experienced abandonment, or have been disowned by their father or mother, or both. Maybe because their father or mother was evil, or just badly broken. It's kind of the same thing. Or maybe their parents were Muslims or Hindus, and the child became a Christian. The point is, Psalm 27 knows suffering. The deepest suffering of the human heart. If you've never been abandoned by your father or your mother, well, it's bad. So David had strong, confident faith. He also knew terrible suffering. And he cried out to God almost in despair. And look at verse 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. It's almost as if David is afraid God won't listen to him. Not that he would say that. If you gave David a theology test on prayer, he would pass it. True or false, God always listens when we pray true. But sometimes it can feel as if God isn't listening as if your prayers just echo back to you because there's no one there. Verses 8 and the beginning of verse 9 show this, this kind of despair. David basically says, Look, Lord, you have told me to seek you. Okay, I'm seeking you. So why are you hiding from me? 
Why would God hide from us if he told us to seek him? He wouldn't. But sometimes it can feel as if God is hiding from us. Thus, we see what's happening in Psalm 27. We see strong faith, terrible suffering, and the wrestling with God when you mix the two. Verses 1 through 6 are spoken to the congregation. Verses 7 through 12 are addressed to God. Verses 13 and 14, well, it's not entirely clear to whom they are spoken. Sometimes a psalm singer would speak to himself. And that's probably what's happening here. The interesting thing about verse 14 is that the verbs in Hebrew are in the singular. So when it says, wait for the Lord, it is not addressing us collectively as a congregation. It is not addressed to the many. It is addressed to the one, to David to the person who would sing or pray this psalm after him, to the sufferer. It is addressed to you personally, to me personally, to us as individuals. And verse 14 is the practical answer to suffering. It says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Do you see how this relates to the ultimate answer to suffering? Someday God makes all things new, new heaven, new earth, new us. It all makes sense. It's all worthwhile. But until then, what do we do? God's answer is in the future. We are in the present. What do we do when we suffer now? Well, there's only one thing we can do. Wait for the Lord. I apologize. I can't give you an easier answer. I wish that I could. But at least it is true and solid. The answer may not be easy to hear, but it is real. And it will get you through the hard times. I remember a dear saint in a church I once served. She had many years before lost a child. The boy was about 13 or 14 years old, I think, when he died. And there is no suffering like the death of a child. She said to me once, sometimes well-intentioned people say something to me that really bothers me. People will say to me, I admire you so much. I don't know how you can go on. I don't think I could. And occasionally she would reply to them, of course you would. You don't have a choice. She told me, we must look to the Lord. She was basically saying the same thing as Psalm 27. And what do you do when you're suffering? Well, you endure. You go on. Because you don't have a choice. And you look to your friends for support, even if they don't always understand. Most of all, you wait for the Lord. I've mentioned before Douglas Gruthius. He is a Christian philosopher and apologist. His wife, Becky, had primary progressive aphasia. It's an aggressive form of dementia that often strikes younger people. And she was quite young uh, when she developed this form of dementia. 
and she lost her memory and her mind to it. And he wrote a book about their journey together called Walking Through Twilight, A Wife's Illness, A Philosopher's Lament. You will find no easy answers and cheerful platitudes in its pages. But toward the end, as Becky's life was moving from twilight to darkness, he dared to grasp at a single ray of light. He wrote, But love is strong as death and stronger. We know this because of an innocent man nailed to a Roman pike of shame, festooned by a dying criminal on each side. That young man died and was buried. Three days later, his tomb was emptied of death, and he was found more alive than any of us are right now. These matchless and unmatchable events are my only hope in life and death, in Becky's life and in Becky's death. Jesus is Lord. Waiting on the Lord is not easy, but we know how the story ends. Scripture tells us, and he who sits upon the throne says, Behold, I am making all things new. Amen.